This is Speaking of Shakespeare, a series of conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, recording from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This conversation is with Heather Knight, Senior Archaeologist, Museum of London Archaeology, or MOLA. This talk will feature recent work on two Elizabethan theater sites associated with Shakespeare, The Boar's Head and The Curtain. We will also discuss another theater site that was simply called The Theater. This talk is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University. This series is also funded with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Hello, Heather. How are you? It is so good to see you again. Hi, Tom. It's really good to see you. Um, unfortunately, not in person, but we'll we'll make do. I had a plan. I had a plan, and uh, it was not. I, I was hoping that I could get I could get you in Japan, uh, and uh, I got some grant money just when the uh, pandemic started. And I had a plan to have a symposium and a short list of people I wanted to come in, bring in to, uh, to debate uh, to, uh, congenially with the, you know, about issues of the theater and, and to do what we did. When we last saw each other, it was the Ro Roehampton uh, Conference, Roehampton Conference that was uh, sponsored and done all by Andy Kesson at uh, right, Roehampton before, Sha before Shakespeare conference before Shakespeare conference and yeah. I had no idea what to expect I've known Andy uh, in correspondence and so forth pretty well but I didn't know what to expect and that was just one of it's one of my fondest memories and and you're part of that and uh, uh, several of the other people who you know we met and made friends and uh, immediately and what a great thing for Andy to do and uh, I'm going to be talking to him next month uh, I I think. And so we'll find out what they've done since then. But I want to go to that because at that time, this was, was it 2017? I think it was yeah. 17. So we're, yeah. So then the curtain was still, you know, rankling people and probably still is now. Uh, but we're going to go to the curtain, but I want to get to the uh, first, what you do at the Museum of London Archaeology and your role there. You are a senior archaeologist, is that right? Yeah. That's right, I am. So MOLA, which is, as you say, stands for Museum of London Archaeology, we're a commercial practice and we conduct hundreds of excavations and archaeological projects across the UK and in normal times internationally every year. But I'm just in a really fortunate position of over the last, what, 14 years, I found a very niche place to, to put myself, and that's in theatre archaeology. So I've been in the real, say, real privileged position of leading the excavations on the theatre, the boar's head, and the curtain. So, uh, yeah. So those are your two, are, they, are you still working on the boar's head now? The excavation's finished. Uh -huh. um, but I'm just starting to put together the post excavation assessments. That means we kind of quantify the data that we have and then we look at it and see what kind of questions are kind of rising out of that data. And then we go on to further analysis. So it's in yep. that kind of halfway halfway house um, yep. situation, which is the same, unfortunately, for, for the curtain <laughs> and for the theatres. So they're all at that kind of stage. I'm just about to do the proper analysis of all three sites. Well, there are two pressure points here that you've come across in your uh, career in, in, in recent times, and particularly if we're talking about uh, the histories that we study, very recent times, and that one of the pressure points is the boar's head, which is more recent, and the boar's head is in Whitechapel, right, the Whitechapel region, and the thing about yeah. the boar's head is you can show that there was activity there before the 1560s. Now, even people in Shakespeare studies might think, well, okay, but there are people heavily invested in the notion that the theaters didn't start until the late 60s and really didn't get going until there was one in the 60s and uh, then the 70s is when things picked up, and so you 
think you found some evidence there. Well, it, it, well it's actually documentary evidence that, yeah. you know, if we were standing there um, on the sort of 5th of September, 1557, the play we wouldn't be seeing is a sack full of news. It was deemed mm -hmm. to be lewd and um, the actors run into trouble with the, with the, with the authorities and, uh, and the performance was halted. <laughs> but it's that kind of, it, it's only because we know about that because they run into trouble with it it kind of raises the questions what other performance was going on that was absolutely fine and every day and wasn't newsworthy. <laughs> That's the sack full of news it was. Um, so yeah, now whether that continued all the way through up until when they built a proper playhouse, we don't know. But we do have that kind of suggestion that it was a place of entertainment in the 15, uh, 1550s. Well, this would have been one of the earliest examples of what we think to be the early modern playhouse, something that might be different from the village festival and the um, types of uh, pageants that they had, which are all, all very, very interesting. But this being an earlier version of the Elizabethan theater that was a public stage where you had this activity that we see years later in Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, in fact, one of the points of the conference that we were in is to bring attention to, Shakespeare tends to eclipse what was before uh, him because of the, mm. um, of course, Shakespeare. And uh, so you're going to have to do a full, you're going to have to do a full uh, write up of what you found at the boar's head. And who are you? Do, do people co contact you and bug you? I think I've bugged you in the past on email, like with questions. Can I say this in the book that I'm about to, you know, publish? Do they do that? Yeah, they do. Um, uh, and it's not bugging. It's, it's, it's people wanting the most up to date information that we have. So that, that's, that's not, that's not bugging me. That's, that's being, you know, um, yeah. I don't know quite what I, I just imagine I just imagine you I imagine you opening your email in the morning and it's all from all over the world right you know I'm in Japan yeah. you're in and these people small favor you know this yeah. <laughs> anytime I see that in the subject heading I'm going oh my goodness it's going to be you know and now I know what I'm doing at the first 45 minutes of my day right because it'll but, be something but that, but that is that is part of my job there's no point me um digging a site and then going, oh, I, I, I know this thing, but I'm not going to tell anybody. I know it's difficult right. at the moment because I say I'm at that halfway house where, I, you know, we're just about to do that final analysis on, on all three sites. And then we can actually say something, you know, sort of pithy about them. But the initial findings, absolutely. But, you know, I can't sort of keep those to myself. You know, it must be. Well, what was the initial, where, what got the um, uh, MOLA? involved in this project in Whitechapel was there something like somebody scratched a wall and said oh you know and they they were happened to be experts in the thing I don't know so it was our our client which is Unite Students they uh, build student accommodation they wanted to redevelop the site so there it's through the planning process and um, you know it's it was known it was likely to be the site of the board's head so they had um, conditions that some you know archaeological excavation had to happen prior to them building on the site so our initial evaluation was to see if anything survived you know what damage had been done by sort of previous development on the site was there any archaeology what was the level nature and extent of that archaeology and those initial evaluations that was back in all oh, 2017 2018 found walls that were likely to be part of the boar's head so then we carried out further excavations in 2019. And what we found is now being preserved in situ. So even though they are building around the archaeology, they're not building through it. So we've identified where the archaeology is and they can actually, they've actually redesigned their building to kind of fit around it. And so it will be preserved under their new structure, which they're calling the playhouse, which I think is quite nice. I think that's very nice. That's very nice. And uh, in, uh, in the more playhouses we get, the better. In particular, <laughs> when we, well, when we can actually see the physical ex, um, evidence. In my, um, 
in my training, which is different from uh, yours, you're, you're out there. I think in one of our emails, you said, you know, I'm out there. I'm in the rain. I'm in the mud. I'm, I'm, I'm on site, you know. And uh, when we talk about evidence in uh, my, my nerdy areas, uh, you know, subfields and so forth, we're usually uh, talking about print, you know, uh, credible, credible uh, original sources or at least scholars with reputations you can trust, that sort of thing. But I have thought many times since meeting you, I wish that I could walk, you know, with a pair of rain boots, one of those, uh, what, Wellingtons or something. I don't know what you might wear, but walk out of a trench with something in my hand and say, here it is. <laughs> okay. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of authority in that, right? I'm, we've been down in there and this is what we found and this is what we're preserving. So yeah. it's, it's making, I think, a physical connection to the past. Yeah. It's the same way if you have an original document, isn't it? it yeah. It's whether you have an original document in front of you or if I'm standing, you know, in, in the yard of the curtain, it's yeah. the same thing. It's making that physical connection, but I make that physical connection to, to place and to space. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also in your discoveries, you find out that some things that have been doctrinaire for d decades, in some cases, about the... Um, history of the theater, but by, by and, and you know uh, works by some really fine scholars. You know, of course, Andrew Gurr and 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 many others I could name. And I think that sometimes scholars say, "Okay, this is what I think from what I've been able to gather." Right. And uh, I was talking with David McGinnis about this too. You know, you're talking about the lost, yeah. the play we don't have, and he just had a book on lost plays released by Cambridge, and that you have. Um, uh, scholars who propose something and then people just sort of jump on and I've done it too. I've been guilty of it too. You say, well, this famous guy said this, so yeah. I can, I can repeat this. I think, yeah, I, no, I think he hit the nail on the head because I think what he was saying, particularly with 19th century um, theater historians yes. was they had that privileged, privileged access yes, yes. to two sources and what they said and what they wrote was very quite hard to challenge. It's it, because people, you know, they, they couldn't maybe access those materials and then those those narratives kind of then get repeated and then distilled and then they became facts and those facts then become um permanent in in people's in people's imaginations yes so yes they do i, I don't they... you know i don't and, it, and it's not historians being um you know particularly in the 19th century it's not them being lazy it's just they don't have access necessarily to those resources well, I feel it all the time because there's the book. I'm in Tokyo. I can get most of most of the things I can I need. I can get now. But when I uh, began 25 years ago in Hiroshima, in Japan, it was it was impossible to get the a number of things. So I just had to rely on what I uh, could, what was available in the libraries there, which was a lot. But you need a lot more, and. Also, I think that because of, we come from a print tradition, that we uh, there's some joy and maybe some fear. Now that these fields, there's a lot more, we're a lot more mobile now. We have much more digital cap capability to, to uh, reproduce in images and to get things out there and information out there. So we're become, becoming much more multidisciplinary and it's joyful to see something new, but I think for a lot of people, it can be kind of fearful. You go, oh no, I just wrote this whole book based on a premise, right? Or part of it based on a premise. Or even, I know from, you feel the same way. You don't want to make any mistakes when you have something that goes into publication. You know, if it's 35.8 meters, you, you don't want it to be 35.6. You want to make sure you get the dimensions right, right? Because someone will be checking behind you. Um, I wanted to pivot uh, because I'm being selfish. I I wanted to pivot back to the curtain because I remember that um, Holger Syim at the, um, I think that's, yeah, Syim is the way uh, Holger was. And yeah. you had, a, I I'm, uh, was at lunch with you guys. I had no idea, but you guys got into an animated and fun conversation about the, the and he did a wonderful paper. So did, so did you, just absolutely well, joyful. Uh, to have both of those perspectives, uh, the, the Holger being in, into the print and uh, what the university scholarly side and you being with the, uh, you know, and a working archaeologist, right? So 
uh, and, and, and both wonderful personalities, of course. But I, I think that a lot of people were really, really shocked. And I talked with David also about this. And I think Brett Hirsch, too, a great, greatly Hirsch, um, that the thing that we tell people or have told people in the past is that these theaters were round. That there's a round, it's round the globe, round, and we, uh, the assumption was the theater and the curtain. Now these were the two earlier theaters in the in the 70s. We see records of them. Andy Kesson will remind you we don't know they could have existed before then. It's just that we do start seeing records in the 70s, and that there does seem to be an uptick in the 70s of theater activity from those two theaters in particular. But I think you are finding that there may be a more of a complex. But one thing, the second point I wanted to bring up was the pressure point was that when you found or when you guys found the um, the curtain, that it wasn't round. It wasn't it wasn't round. And that, that was that was very sad for a lot of people. Uh, well, I thought it was round to start with. Oh, so well, you went in with that ah, pretty... yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I went, I went down the round route originally, and um, when we did the first evaluation, that's when we, you know, do those initial trial trenches. That was back in 2011, and the only available area for me to put some trenches in was a sort of really narrow roadway that ran parallel with Curtain Road, and. I managed to get two trenches in there and I found we had um, two quite substantial brick walls with little doorways in and they were 14 meters apart, sort of 3.8 meters, maybe four meters back from each of those walls was what appeared to be an outside wall of a building. The outside space was half a meter higher than the inside space and all of this matched exactly the model of the rose and what we were finding at the theatre. So at that point, I had nothing to say. Um, this wasn't one of those polygonal structures, 22 no. metres across, no. gallery surrounding a yard no. with these kind of, you know, ingressors stand into a gravel surface. Yeah. Um, but I say I was really limited that I, I couldn't expand that kind of area I was looking at because there were still buildings on the site. So it's only when those modern buildings were uh, demolished because I then kind of look at other areas and then we found a corner and it's like oh hold on a minute that's a right angle corner and then we were thinking hang on a minute the that's, that's a, it's a corner and then I yeah and, and then I had to kind of rethink really well what, you know what is it we've actually got and yeah. it was like well the the only thing you know I, I was kind of doubting more is it actually the curtain at that point you know because this doesn't fit those preconceived those narratives that says it's a round structure yeah. But the more I looked, it was like, no, this this is the curtain, but it's more like the uh, Almagro, the playhouse in Spain. And when I was looking at that, I'm thinking, yes, they're virtually virtually identical in the way they operate. So but what yeah. so what happens then is that you get a client who says, we want to do some building, and we need you as part of the uh, uh, chain of uh, because we're in a historic designated historic city of course all right you go through and you check and sometimes there's nothing of any importance and sometimes there might be well with the curtain with the curtain it was slightly different because there was a big round brown plaque on the wall that says this is the site of the curtain theater it'd been there since the 70s yeah. so the then client was looking at um, basically um commissioned us to see if any of the curtains survived on the site and whereabouts it was because they were looking to see if they could redevelop the site. They then, uh, a new client then took that project on when they realized we did have the curtain. So they actively took on a site knowing that it was the site of the curtain theater. And that archeology span has been absolutely central sort of physically and conceptually at the heart of that project yeah yeah well i've seen uh you have some good examples online that are available and of course i got to see your presentation i i meant to, <laughs> i meant to get i wanted to go to what would i see now if i went to the site of the curtain uh the site of the curtain is still very much a live construction site mm -hmm. um it's being you know obviously the remains are being protected while they build um, a structure around it and hopefully it will be um, 
a space where you can then actually go and see the curtain. Whoa. So that's they're actually kind of creating that kind of um, sort of visitor center around it at the moment. Yeah. So, you know, may, may, maybe a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, for uh, maybe some of my my students, the Curtain Theater is famous. Uh, well, first of all, that's where probably Romeo and Juliet, I think almost certainly Romeo and Juliet, uh, they've decided that's where it was played first. Mm. And, well, whether, uh, whether, whether it was first there or first at the theater, um, yes. it was played there. I think, it was I played think at go, the curtain, yeah. We, yeah, it's a Shoreditch play. Was, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So that's one, one reason. But if the theater, by the time Shakespeare came on the scene, had uh, been in existence for, uh, you know, let's say decades, two decades, Two decades, perhaps. He, he was. I, I, I kind of. I was thinking about this the other day. He was probably about twelve when the Curtain Theatre was built. Probably about twelve years old. Yeah. Right? So he walked so, yeah. right into this infrastructure that was already there it and was, was already, already up and running and a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that's important that this stuff would. Uh, this stuff uh, is the that without which. You know, if Shakespeare had not, if these people hadn't built these theaters, it's, it's something that happened. And I do kind of uh, I'll peck away at, uh, get uh, pretentious about the idea of Renaissance, because, it, yes, I understand the reawakening, re, um, bringing the classics back in and so forth. But this theater is really nascent. It's, it's the first of its kind. And that I can see, I mean, we can relate it to old Roman theater. We can, but these big commercial playhouses, and I just don't see anything in England before that, uh, before the roughly the well, Elizabethan. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's more, it's more a gradual progression. Mm. You know, I mean, we have Rastall stage, whatever Rastall stage looked like yeah. in Shoreditch in Finsbury Field in the 1520s. Yeah, yeah. We have the Red Lion, um, yeah. you know, 1560s. 60s, yeah. We have um, the Curtain, probably mid 1570s, mm -hmm. may maybe 75, 76, mm -hmm. maybe predates the theatre, but only by a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Newington Butts in the yeah. 1570s as well. So the, it, it's not a sort of, you know, I think this is more of a gradual pro progression of mm. uh, development rather than, hey, we're going to build this thing from you know from nowhere built on you know a fresh idea heather am i right in saying i think that you mentioned to me that there the uh, the kind of now famous playhouse in spain not now famous it's been famous but uh jesus tranche has recently not, over the past years uh and his team they put together a uh, digital recreation and is i guess it's the olivera olivera uh playhouse in between Barcelona and Granada. And is it right, is it, you, am I right in saying that you said that theater is similar to the Curtain Theater? Well, I, yeah, I've, I've been looking at the Playhouse in El Magro, mm -hmm. which is halfway between Madrid and Granada. Yeah. And they, they seem very similar. So if you have wall-to-wall -wall standing at ground level, you have uh, this kind of wide stage with side stage rooms either side, and then you get this sort of passage under the stage. So a couple of steps down, you can then pass under the stage. Um, yeah, the more the more I look at these kind of uh, these these buildings, the more I think, oh, yeah, that's that, that's how the curtain works, and it, and it's lovely to have you know a whole a whole building to look at, as we do in Spain. Yeah. Have you managed to see the reconstruction that is this playhouse is 17th century and but I don't I'm not quite sure exactly 1658 and 1750. I think I'm right in saying that it might be that the playhouses on the continent may have been a little bit more foo foo uh, poshy. I'm not sure. Uh, whereas we think of the English playhouse as much I'm, more. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm oh. actually. I'm. I, I'm actually thinking about the uh, the fencing school or the playhouse in Gdansk. Yeah, yeah. Which was, but you know, the, the, there's that sort of um, later engraving, but it looks kind of fairly 
public non elite yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. Yeah, they, you don't want to say no, that. It looks, it, it looks, yeah, it, it looks fairly, uh, you know, it's non foo foo. <laughs> non foo foo. So, no, non foo foo. Yeah, not, uh, yeah, not, not non foo foo. So, yeah, it's, very, uh, it's a very functional space. Yeah, they are functional yeah. spaces. And that one lasted a long time as well. So you've got, you've got say, Gdansk being built um, yeah. sort of, what, six, 1600 or so. And there's a description of it still in use from the 18th century. Yeah. So, you know, and again, that's another thing I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Is there any link between the curtain and the playhouse in Gdansk? You know, it's always said the Gdansk Playhouse was based on the fortune. But that's when we only thought, you know, the fortune was the only square building. You think there was any communication between the peoples, the uh, the builders? Um, well, we, we, we know we know, we know we, we've got that kind of um, actors are moving between um, London and Gdansk at that point. We've got yeah. You know John John Green's performing there, Thomas Green's brother, and 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 he's you know he's 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 involved in both the the curtain and the and the boar's head. Yeah. So you know again is it's, it's almost like there's a sort of smoking gun there. You know, is there this you know the connection that we're just not. Uh huh. That we're just so not so we have yeah so we have London we have Gdansk and we have Spain there are probably yeah. other places, uh, and uh, and we have a digital reconstruction. Uh, 17th century Oliveira Playhouse in uh, Valencia for uh, the virtual reality uh, VR experience. And uh, that was uh, a paper that was given by uh, Jesus Tronch and uh, Gemma Burgos uh, Segarra. And I think that the, the Juan Oleza at the University of Valencia directed, the digital project directed by um, Oleza. So uh, I wanted to do a kind of shout out to those people who are doing that fine work because they're doing uh, digital, dig digitally kind of what you're doing physically, very physically. Mm. And also they, these places were venues that weren't, they were not uh, built necessarily, you know, not, they, they weren't palaces. They're not built to last for uh, centuries. You know, they, they, some of these playhouses were fairly, uh, uh, you know, uh, what makeshift and some of the ends, ends and, um, and that sort of thing. So, uh, and there were fires and mm. there, there's financial trouble all the way through, of course, you know, they're just, they're theater well, people. I think, I, I think, well, actually, I mean, I mean, the curtain could be the odd one out here, really, because yeah. it, it, it doesn't burn down. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't, doesn't have, no. it doesn't really have financial or, um, you know, there, there's no legal disputes, no legal wrangling over it. So we don't, it doesn't appear in the court records. Mm -hmm. It just carries on doing its thing. And it probably carries on doing its thing for about 50 years. You know, yeah. all the way through from the mid, you know, 15, yeah. 1570s through to 1627 or so. Yeah. And A I good... think it's, it's successful and, and it just carries on and it does its thing. And it's quite interesting because I've read, it's kind of going back to what David McInnes was saying, because you don't hear about something. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, it's, it's like, oh, well, we only know about the, the plays that we have because they're the good ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, well, this is just, you know, quietly got on and did its thing. And, and I've read, you know, oh, people said, oh, well, it obviously wasn't a proper playhouse because we don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite the quite the reverse it doesn't work it doesn't work that way yes no, it, and then it's the same same you know sort of reading david mckinnis's book about you know loss and why we why things get lost you know why plays disappear it doesn't mean that they they were <laughs> they were rubbish at all it, oh you know, no i the reverse you know, you know I think of uh, when I'm going to kind of show my age here. When I was a boy, I remember the album by the Rolling Stones that had the actual zipper on the outside vinyl album. And it was kind of obscene that way in a sort of joke. And that, you know, I could have purchased 10. I had enough money. I could have maybe purchased more than 10 or and just put them up somewhere and preserve them. And if I had those now unopened, uh, it'd be quite valuable. And so, but at the time that that album came out, we didn't see it. We saw it as rock and roll as sort of throwaway stuff. You know, after a while, you know, 
the the vinyl era at the one point it starts skipping and uh that sort of thing uh so we didn't know uh, that we were dealing with uh things that would become famous so i don't think they did either in some cases the theater though i'm sorry the curtain does seem to like you say be standing out there somebody was able to keep it going and it was a bigger it was a bigger venue than uh people expected and the types of plays there would well the way you'd stage to play would change from uh the other types of theaters and uh it was a bigger deal than once thought is that is that right i think so yeah yeah it's it's got that kind of you know the stage is sort of 14 meters wide um, when you're looking at uh, say the stage at the rose or the theater the you know where it's it's, it's kind of that sort of uh, those buildings it's sort of like a squash sort of octagon isn't it mm -hmm. you've got sort of mm -hmm. five possible sort of bays or discovery spaces at the back and sort of three fairly flattish sides at the front the maximum width on that stage at say the rose or or the theater if it's does mirror the rose as we think it does is 12 meters mm. and, and and you've got those kind of tapering edges so the actual usable space is 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 much less whereas at the at the curtain you've got you know sort of 14 meters by you know five meters back to front you, you can get a whole load more people on that stage yeah you, yeah. you can do you can do more with that space so was their move was the Chamberlain's men move to the curtain in the sort of late 1590s, not one out of necessity that, you know, that the lease is up at the theater, oh, we've got to find somewhere else. Mm. Or was it more of a positive move? Was it a choice? We're actually moving to the curtain because we want to stage um, Henry V. Uh, we want that kind. Do you know what I mean? It's like this play would work better on this. And it, and is it actually that the the there's a shift in in the type of things that they're performing, the amount of people in a company? Um, yeah, yeah. This is what oh, I think. So this, is why got... Holger, this is why this is why Holger was excited. You know, it's like yeah. wow, you can get so many more people on this stage. This is yeah. amazing. You know. Yeah. It's a well. Big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's right. And so you can cross reference these things and you know from the, the evidence of there being more players in uh, Henry V and how, mm -hmm. how perhaps they, they tried to do that. And of course, I would probably get nerdy and say just the beginning where they come out when, uh, with the prologue that uh, the chorus that apologizes for not being able to bring in the real war and so forth. Uh, kind of sort of hints that they that they felt like they had something pretty good mm. to, to show uh, that they they were going to put out a put on a pretty powerful performance about a, a great battle. So yeah. now the curtain and the theater, uh, who was it? I think it was David again who was talking about the, this, this kind of hint that there may have been a kind of uh, mm, what would you call it? A, a sort of hub there, a sort of complex uh, where they were, there's the idea that maybe this is the, this is going to be the theater district uh, mm. with those theaters. But uh, is that something that your research is? Well, they're, they're, they're run as a joint venture. You know, if, if you look at it that way, you know, it's sort of from the 1580s, they're kind of run as a sort of joint venture, but nobody's kind of really understood that the actual financial structure. You know, I mean, no, nobody's quite understood quite how that, the business of that works. But yeah, I mean, there's nothing to say they weren't playing at the curtain before the late 1590s. You know, were they using these venues differently? I don't, I don't know, and I don't think we're going to find that through archaeology. You know. Yeah, it's it's not going to be proven through archaeology, but it can be if people keep uh, putting things out there. Like mm -hmm. we don't get to we we're not in London like you are, many of us. And we're not able to walk on site. You know, at one, one point, I would love to visit London and, and get out to these places. And uh, yet we, uh, there's some of us who are into other archives, other records at other places. And 
and and run across things you remember and see things and bring something out there's a lot of scholarship out there that, that, where scholars are very thorough i'm thinking immediately of ek chambers or or uh, i could name a num number of them who really were diligent in putting everything they could came across in their notes but at one point, you, you, you begin not to see what is important from what is not important. And sometimes something that doesn't seem to be important becomes important. And I'm sure that happens in archaeology, too, where you're, yes. you're looking for this. I mean, I, I want to know what, and my wife asked me this question. She said, at what point does somebody know they have something like an old theater? Like, at what point do you go there? And there's this, that someone says, listen, this looks like it's going to be, you know, 16th century. And that okay. is a wall, and there's yeah. not supposed, and, it's, and this is where we think this theater, all right, is that what happens? It's sort of a... Yeah, the, the, there's not one point you go, oh, that's that's definitely it. That's definitely the curtain, and it certainly happened with the curtain. We, we were looking, yeah. constantly looking at the evidence we had. We had brick walls. They were the right date. They were in the right place. They were not quite the right shape initially. Do you know what I mean? We're thinking we're looking for something round, and these aren't quite yeah. right, but okay, we go with it. But we're also looking at the other things, kind of depositional signature of a playhouse, for instance. So things you'd expect to find in a place of commercial entertainment. And now, I mean, with the Boar's Head, the Boar's Head had the benefit of being the seventh playhouse to be dug. So, you know, there's obviously the Rose, the Globe and the Hope on Bankside. We mm -hmm. dug a tiny part of the Globe back in um, 1989 when the Rose was dug. Um, We've also obviously dug the theatre. Uh, UCL's um, Archaeology Southeast have dug the site of the Red Lion and then obviously had the curtain and then the boar's head. So we think, oh, we're, we are finding things together. We are finding these assemblages that are common to all these, all these spaces, but yeah. uncommon to say a domestic dwelling. Yeah. Yeah. So you can start refining. It's, it's like that sort of depositional signature, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, okay, I'm finding things that I'd expect to find in a place of commercial entertainment. I've got this building that, I mean, I mean, we went through, okay, if it's not the curtain, what could it be? And we went through every single, we were every single permutation of, okay, what could it be if it's not, not the theatre? And we came back to, well, there, there isn't anything left so you kind of add all of this together and it's a sort of it becomes sort of balance of probabilities that becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until you can say well yeah we're, we're now left with it is the curtain it's easier i think to do with a building such as the rose you know because there was there's was much more of it and it was this you know it's, uh. it's got 14 sides it's got an obvious stage it's like you know yes and it, and it kind of fits those um, images that we have of playhouses on Bankside as well. It's like, look, yes, it looks like one of these drawings. But with, with the curtain, it was much more a careful kind of, you know, we really have to be certain. Yeah. We really have to be certain. And it was that balance of, um, you know, the physical building itself and the assemblage of finds that accompany it yeah. together. Said, so, yes, I think we have you know we, we have a building from the 1570s 1580s it goes out of use in the 1620s it's repurposed we can you know it's like yeah i think so it's, it's not it's not an immediate yes that's definitely the curtain that's the curtain. yeah <laughs> and i think a lot of people i think a lot of people thought that's what i'd done which is kind of like you know but they didn't talk to me so you know <laughs> well you know it's uh it's what it is the, out, out there. I mean, you, uh, you can't change the shape of it, and the and, no. and it makes a it makes a huge huge difference uh, in terms. Oh, it of makes how it, it makes it makes things much more interesting, I much so. much more interesting because we had up to that point, I guess, a very linear idea of playhouse development. You yeah. know, they started off as small round things, and then they got to be bigger round things, yeah. with the globe being the pinnacle of big roundness <laughs> if you like which well, didn't take into which didn't take into account things like the fortune right right you know we have fortune built same you know slightly after the globe but it was just kind of it didn't really fit that pattern so it was just not really i don't know it just sort of 
was on its own being weird and strange uh-huh. and now we've got this much more i guess tangential development where you you have you know both shapes both forms are equally valid you yeah. know they don't start off rectangular or square and then become round if you look at them chronologically both shapes are equally valid all the way through that period yeah so yeah and why not i mean it makes sense you you can do both uh, you have companies and plays that are designed to to go into a lots of uh, well, if you if you play it any number of the court venues that you would have to adjust to space on the moment. I, it might I might uh, the queen might decide she wants to be at uh, Greenwich rather than the other place wherever the plan. And so you have to think of, well, that's going to be a different space. And these mm-hmm. these people, a lot of these companies played at court, uh, and so they were very accustomed to adapting to new space. And uh, yeah, it, 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 in some ways, it just doesn't make sense that they would all, all of the public ones would be round, you know? No, it, it, and, and I think what you're left with, actually, if you look at it spatially, what you're left with is quite interesting. When Once the theater has been demolished, what, sort of 1598, hmm. what you're left with, or what you're left with, you have the Red Bull, you have the Fortune, you have the Curtain, and um if initial um my initial understandings of what um ucl have been doing at the red lion possibly the red lion as well still carrying on at this point as square rectangular venues north of the city whereas the round venues the globe the swan the hope uh, the rose they were all on bank side so there's this weird geographical split, which I think is equally, that, that is, that's exciting. I, I think and it's absolutely fascinating. And I, I think it's probably fascinating. And I don't, and I don't, I don't really know what the answer or uh, answer is to why or how, or, but I think that that's quite an interesting thing. Well, I mean, you have to have it outside the city because there are problems, Blackfriars, Blackfriars famously, the problems with yeah. having theaters in the city. But and they're, they're, but they're not that far outside the city. I mean, literally, no, the, the Boar's Head is literally the other side of the road to the city. It's, uh, yeah. The curtain is probably about 200 meters outside the city authorities' jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah, the fortune is just on the edge. Just on the edge. The red, yeah, yeah they are all yeah. just on the edge. They are literally yeah. just stepping over. Well, so. it, you know, and and there is uh, the people think of well Shoreditch now as part of metropolitan London. It's you yeah. know, but in uh, the 16th century, it was you're getting into the fields there. You're you're at uh, yes, Finsbury yeah. Fields and you know in that yeah. area. And you see the maps and there's there's not much out there, which is another reason, I guess, you can determine that the theater was the, I mean, the curtain was the curtain. But yeah, that, that makes sense. But north that way, you know, why would you then start shifting over south across the river? Both of those areas were working, were places that thrived for a long time. If you keep the curtain in play there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting if you put if you put the curtain slightly before the theater yeah in terms of chronology say only by a year yeah or even six months archaeology supports that that that's fine it can sit it can sit there at sort of 1575 1576 so you've then got newington butts mm-hmm. okay so, south south of the river quite a way south you then have the curtain north mm-hmm. you then have the next oh, obviously the red lion's doing its own thing mm-hmm. as well it's carrying on out in uh, out in mile end mm-hmm. is it then what's the driver for burbage to build the theater where he does mm-hmm. okay now that's that, that's now an interesting one because the curtain's built essentially off the back of a structure, possibly curtain house. So it's in a field. It, it, it's quite an easy thing to do because you, you've got nice open space to use. You, you mm-hmm. build this rectangular structure in a nice open space. The theatre, not so much. He's taken on his lease. He's got to demolish things. He's got to prop up a barn. He's got to squeeze this building in. It's a really difficult space. 
actually to use. You know, he's, he's, he's literally fitting this weird polygonal thing in. Is it the same kind of driver that he does when he builds the globe on Bankside? It's like, you, you've got the rose, let's put the globe right next to it. Yeah. Is that the, do you know what I mean? It's like this sort of kind of arms race. Is that his MO? <laughs> is, he, is he kind of, you know, moving into, we've already got this established thing. Yeah. Let's move in next door. Uh, I don't know. That's, I, that's I, kind I of see. something I've, that's kind of thin, thin, thin around the back of my head at the moment. You know, what, what was his, what was his, um, why, why did he take on the lease? At, yeah. Within the Holy World Priory. Yeah, it's not it's, it's not it's not an easy it's not an easy space to to develop. He's he, he's got to do a lot. He's got to demolish things, and he's I'd say he's got proper barn up. He's there's lots of things he's got to do. Yeah, it's not an easy space. It's not easy space. Uh, I'm taking your word for it, but I'm I'm thinking that there's some. I'm getting way away. There's some sort of. <laughs> There's so, away from my specialty. I'm about to talk about retail. I think there's some rule of retail that uh, maybe two stores isn't better than one, but three or four in a similar location is better than yeah. one because then you become a magnet for more people. There may have been some kind of thinking like that, or maybe even two is better than one. Uh, in in yeah. terms of theaters, it becomes oh, we're going to go to the theater. And let's go. Now we know uh, we're predisposed to walk a little bit north of town and go out there and uh, and maybe participate in more, you know, go to buy tickets for more plays. Uh, it's, you know, fully commercial enterprise. Uh, I wonder about that, too. And then I, I wonder we, we're still it's still kind of a mystery about how the theater was you know, finished and then became the globe. Uh, you know that story of the, how how the timber may have gone across the Thames or what. You know, I'm I'm, yeah, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did reuse the material. Yeah. I mean, archaeologically, I can see that they did a very good job of demolishing it. You know, they've taken it down to ground level. Yeah, they've taken yeah. the superstructure away. Yeah, um, from the very small um, part of the globe that we've dug, and from what we've done at the theatre, we know those those are not carbon copies of each other. Ah. the globe is bigger uh -huh. so yes they have probably incorporated the materials from the theater into the new into their new building in some way but it's certainly not sort of like you know flat pack furniture yeah they haven't taken one you know haven't taken this one down and then moved it over there and then rebuilt it yeah but they have probably yes they, yeah materials are expensive they're saving money you know they're, yeah. they're reusing things they're reusing materials where they can I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, so oh no! Doubt I, that at all. Um, but I'm just quite interested. Well, the other thing is then. Okay, we're going to build. A, we're going to build this new thing. We're going to build the globe. We're going to build it bigger. Yeah. Is that a response to the fact the curtain's big? Are we building the globe bigger? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very good argument. That yeah, why not? We're going to do a new theater. Let's get more people in here. Yeah, we're not going to do. Yeah, the last one was we we, we couldn't really use. It was a bit small, so we're going to make this one bigger. Yeah. yeah. Is it? I mean, you know, the other question that's been you know kind of floating around the back of my mind is why do they remodel the rose when they do? You know, that rose goes through that remodeling in the fifteen nineties. Yeah, yeah. You know, the audience side of, stays round, but it's the stage end. That kind of widens out and becomes more rectangular. Is it that actually affording them more more space? Is it becoming more like these, you know, more curtain like maybe? Well, you know, again, is it actually? Yeah. I think it's actually time to to revisit the driver behind why do they remodel the roads if it's a perfectly functioning building? Yeah, more people. Basically. Why, why do it? Yes, yeah. More Can people. we get more people? More? Yeah, yeah. It makes perfect sense. And there may be other evidence, and uh, I'm not, again, an expert in it, but some, some evidence in the um, chronicle somewhere that shows uh, public interest. It makes sense that public interest increased, uh, that your audience, you have a city that's growing, that just that, they could accommodate more people, they could sell more tickets. Well, now, is there some type of uh, next project? Is there anything that's on the horizon that you can talk about or... Uh, well, well, for, for for me, I've got three 
lovely sites that I really do need to do some some work. There, with. There's uh, plenty there. There's plenty. <laughs> there's going to um, be plenty there to keep me busy yeah, for a long for time. A yeah. long, long time. Yeah. Long uh, time. So I'm really but, looking forward to doing that and actually getting some, uh, you know, results out there so people don't have to keep sending me an email saying, you know, can you tell me a bit about this? It's like, you know, it's there. So ideally, um, the kind of the raw data will actually be online. So yeah. people can see that kind of raw data, you know, yeah. and, and that will that will live there, you know, forever. Yeah. And then hopefully I can publish something that's um, more accessible yeah. to a wider audience yeah. than just talking to archaeologists. That, that That's my ideal, you know, that we can actually get results out there that, you know, other disciplines can find useful. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I love the I, I wish somebody would come in and work with you guys or something to to maybe make a digital reproduction uh, like they've done with uh, like John Wall and his team have done at NC State University with the uh, book bookshops of St. Paul's uh, cross Paul's cross churchyard. Well, the good thing uh, about the curtain, actually, or, you know, is, is I don't think I'm ever going to have one. This is, you know, one conjecture. This is what I think it looked like. At the moment, I've got probably five models floating around in my head. Oh, really? With front, you know, with different front doors, with different arrangements. How does the outside space work? So I don't think I'm ever going to come up with, this is the curtain. It's like, okay, is, is the front door on this side? Do you come in via the open space to the north? Do you actually come in via curtain house? Um, how does those, you know, how does this internal arrangements work? Yeah. Which I think would really does lend itself to kind of a digital um modeling yes we can actually look at them and and kind of you know which one which one works best how yes how can you actually use those spaces yes you could get into 3d i'm thinking about mm. uh, yeah. uh, sloan and uh gordon malcolm uh on the uh the, this is what you're talking about at, yeah. at mola right this yeah <laughs> okay that's and, traditionally and, uh, that's traditionally how archaeologists have published things yes which is completely understandable if you're an archaeologist yes uh and it's not very helpful i don't think if you are trying to access that information if you're coming from another discipline it, it is difficult i'm i'm showing tables yeah. here i think that we'll probably uh put some yeah uh, this, just to show how difficult it is yeah. and you you could look at a picture like this and you would probably see something significant and i go yeah. well <laughs> that's uh <laughs> some stone and a wall but I, yeah. there is in this book the uh, diagrams of the uh, now this is the excavations of the pr uh, priory of the order of the hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, Clerkenwell, yeah. London. And this is where the office of the rebels was during the Elizabethan period. Yeah, I, I, re I realized yeah. why you had that. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so and I've been writing I've been writing on the office of the Re uh, rebels and the rebels office and studying that, but it does give us these diagrams. Now this came out in 2002, I think, uh, some time ago, but one problem, I, I'm, I have a paper coming out right now where I would love to include this, but it's, a, uh, it's an opening. I can't get a good impression. And so if you're out of field, if you don't really know what you're talking about, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense being reproduced uh, as an yeah. image, and it's really a kind of important to the uh, to the notion in this case of work. I'm talking about workmen and you know, Midsummer Night's Dream, but uh, how close they were working with actors. You know that you would have carpenters and all the, these laborers who were making things and items uh, at this office, and several of us out there are interested in and in why there hasn't been more work uh done since this you know magnificent piece here um but it's sort of like done and that's it but there's more there i think and uh the yeah. more to, and i think it's part of the engine that's driving this that you're talking about uh that's that's why i'm kind of spending some time on this i didn't have it on our original agenda i don't like to talk too much about my stuff uh because it's, it's, well, you're no, the, no, you're no, 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 because it's, no, this uh, is the thing is is our stuff yeah and this is this is kind of you know you were talking about before shakespeare earlier i i kind of make the analogy that it's almost like theatre historians and archaeologists. We've been living next door to each other for years. Yeah. We live in our yeah. houses and we go out into the back garden and we look over the fence and go, oh, that's interesting. 
Yeah. You know, archaeologists look at the, what the historians are doing and go, oh, that's interesting. And historians come out and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Andy actually came round, knocked on the door and says, do you want to come round? So we came round and he went, do you know this fence? Let's get rid of it. And yeah. we've managed to get rid of that fence. And now we've got a shared space yeah. that we can do things in. And it's yeah. that interdisciplinary shared space, which yeah. for me has just been such a bonus. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've got so much from this uh, in understanding the buildings that I find. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it's our thing is how I like to look at it. You know, yeah. it's not not one, you know, one disciplines or another. It has to be that shared space that we occupy now. And that's why I want something that's accessible in the publications. Yeah. Uh, and there are other uh, outside of, you know, there are people who do uh, print largely the history of the book and other things that are maybe not as performance oriented and so forth. But it all does work together. The, mm. to uh, when you're trying to build the the yeah, bigger we picture have, we have more we have more people joining in that garden you know we're having a massive yeah. big garden party and it's i felt that spirit at the conference uh the yeah. andy's conference and uh it was uh i wish we would have another one i hope we can do that again i hope post, uh, post covid it would be fantastic to have an in-person you know in-person get together because i'm sure you know we've all done so much since then you know yeah. that's you know what four years ago have uh we uh, plague is in, important in theater to talk <laughs> about the theaters because of the uh, plague affected you know we're talking about the expansion but they they were hit in the 90s i think 92 to 94 15 90s uh with yeah. uh, a horrible plague and theaters were closed so uh the, the that probably would work against any attempts at that point to expand but i think you're talking about attempts more in the later 90s right after mm -hmm. the after the play yeah. yeah um but during the covid crisis has that uh did that slow up your work significantly in uh on site or in what you were doing or were you pretty much able to continue um well personally i was actually um say do, doing that kind of those post -ex assessments yeah so i wasn't actually out on site so you know um uh, it, that kind of, I kind of work around that, but um, yeah, it's been difficult for everybody, hasn't it? It's like, yeah. you know, just just trying to get on with normal life has been has been put on hold, rather to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if we're going to get back. I don't. I think it's going to be kind of like nine eleven was. You know, there was sort of the world before nine eleven and the world after. For those of us who travel a lot, uh, in mm -hmm. particular, and. Uh, I think that this is going to be a, a different kind of world, but it certainly yeah. looks like it's going to get better. And that's, that's good. So basically the future of your work is the continued documentation and uh, development is kind of the future of history uh, that you're going to develop these sites in ways and maybe they haven't been decided yet, right? You might try to make the uh, theater into a venue where people could actually go and experience the, the space is that the goal yeah, yeah. okay well the the, the cool thing uh, i think there's a really cool thing about the theater the the curtain and the boar's head is they kind of created this cultural landscape in in london you know in east london in in the 16th century and the new developments that are taking place on that site incorporate the archaeology so there's you know we've had um clients that have been enthusiastic about having archaeology on their sites and the theatre um, is now the theatre courtyard gallery uh, that would have been open last year but obviously uh, due to covid that that hasn't happened so i'm going to try and find out when that actually will open that is a museum space um, built around and incorporating the the archaeology the boar's head although no you know the building's over the archaeology, the archaeology is being referenced within the building, and that will be an exhibition and performance space, and the same at the curtain. So they'll be working together again to create mm. a new cultural landscape in the 21st, just they did in, in, in the 16th. And I think that's actually quite cool. Well, I was in Barcelona recently, and they have a Roman town that's sort of under underground that they have excavated, mm. and they allow you to they built structures where you can walk through and see a little town 
a Roman village with the explanations in various languages and so forth. But it's a wonderful way to interact. And they've tried to recreate it as much, preserve it, but then allow uh, the public in a way that won't damage the site in to, to see things, which is uh, uh, a, a nice a nice sort of thing. And I, when, it, when it happens, when it's done well. Um, so the um, there, there was a pub in the curtain. I, I wanted to talk a, just a little bit about there's a mm -hmm. pub story in there that I think it's the basement of the pub abuts or is part of the is that yeah if, if you if you look at uh, the plan of the curtain about a quarter of it sits under the adjacent property which is the horse and green pub on curtain raid so there is a chance that some um possibly the yard possibly some you know actually yeah it would be the yard at that point and possibly part of curtain house actually survives under the pub oh there may be more under the pub there may be more but the pub's listed so the pub's not going anywhere so no so you can't you have to wait till the of course the pub probably uh, enjoys the some extra uh, custom from it, it may it may well this, do yes yeah, yeah it may well do yeah um because when the theater is doing well, so do other things. You're talking about growth oh. in the theater and so forth. It also is a growth in the economy. I, th I think south of, <laughs> south, south of the Thames, it might have been kind of a, um, what, uh, in a red light district in, in certain, in, before there were red lights. Uh, but uh, um, I don't think it was just confined to south of the Thames, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There were various really. types of various types of yeah. enter entertainment. Yeah. Um, well, that's uh, that's just wonderful. Uh, so uh, I'm going to I'm looking here at my notes to see if we've uh, covered some. I think that we've gotten through uh, what I wanted to get through. I wanted to make sure that you were introduced to our audience, I, and I'm particularly my Japanese colleagues. And you don't have to worry about they they're very polite about sending uh, emails, but they uh, I, I do want to make sure that your work and the work at MOLA is uh, widely recognized in Japan, in Japan. You know, when when you see these places on the website or whatnot, you think of these people, you know, senior archaeologists, you know, I'm thinking, I don't know, some guy with an ascot and a pipe, you know, who goes out, you know, some guy. Uh, whoever you know going out to discover the nile the source of the nile or you know that, that kind of thing and it's a 19th century view of what an archaeologist is yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically that that's some kind of or some kind of harrison ford thing but the mm -hmm. uh, uh but the thing is when you meet people you're like, oh these are just people these are just like people people and uh and i can talk to them like you can yeah. contact them and you can uh find out stuff from them and yeah, yeah. you don't have to ask permission to, you know, get, uh, I don't know, some sort of recommendation from the queen or something to enter the building. You have, you, you, it's a, it's a place that you can go into. Now, where is MOLA located? Do you have anything on site there that is, uh, that people visit or is it, I've noticed you've done not, some. Not, 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 current, not currently on the uh, site of the curtain, because that's obviously, as I say, it's a live construction site at the moment. So, yeah. uh, not at the moment but um do check out our website yeah our website's really good we've got you know we do have uh, various events and things um that's yeah i saw that you were doing a ambulatory thing a walk uh, i'm having trouble there was we a... did we did we did yes. for the boar's head yeah it's when we were digging the boar's head we had sort of um sort of lectures and walking tours and things like that um while we were on site but obviously we're not on site anymore so and that's fun that's fun and that's a lot of people that isn't just uh uh nerds like me that's just people you know a lot of people love theater and a lot of people love walking around and looking at old things uh <laughs> never uh never tire of it and i think i'm i'm one of those people um well okay well I, uh, at some point, if you don't m mind, I might have another question for you about uh, uh, St. John's uh, Clerkenwell, although I think I'm, I've finished that paper. And I think I got through it without, uh, uh, without any of you folks finding something and proving the whole thesis to be wrong. I'm <laughs> but I'm kind of on the Heather side of the thesis. I'm thinking that 
the you're you're talking about how the inner the interactivity of scholars now right in archaeology whatever uh, uh interdisciplinary cooperation the in, the great importance of that but there seemed to be a lot of that going on in the theater scene in the 16th century where you would have you would have to collaborate you, you know the carpenters would have to collaborate with a uh, wire drawer, I don't know, with other people uh, to to make properties for uh, stage plays. You'd have to deal with space. You'd have to deal with actors. You would probably had plenty of uh, personalities uh, that were, <laughs> you know, theater types as we would, you know, actors and so forth. But yeah, you, you, you've also got people, you know, you've got all those kind of um, add-ons where, you know, people are selling, you know, fruit and beer and things like that. You've got that happening. You know, you, you've had to employ somebody to collect money. You're having to, yeah. Yeah, and you found some stuff there uh, in the curtain that was interesting to me because of its, uh, it's sort of marginal to what we think about the playhouse. There were mm -hmm. some items, there were some little items that had to do with a... Um, oh, the, the pops from money pots the money pots yeah yeah the money pots. Those so again a, a, again it, it's, it's one of those things they're the kind of thing you'd expect to find um in a place of commercial entertainment so yeah. i think we've, we've got about a dozen or so from the boar's head um a couple of dozen from the theater 80 or so i think from the curtain they're the little kind of distinct finials for a better word, that sit on top of these little pots. They're like little um, ceramic round little vessels about the size of a grapefruit, the slot in the side that you put your money in. And again, actually, it's a really good example of received narrative, actually, because for years and years and years, I've been guilty of it, I've said it. Yes, these were used at the door to collect money in. And it was actually, it was actually Bill Ingram who actually said to me, are you sure? You know, surely, you know, if you think about how many people you're coming through the door, how many, you know, how many coins can you fit in one of these pots? You know, I, I was kind of like, well, actually, yeah, Bill, you might. You, uh, is it just something that I've read and I've repeated because we're all guilty of doing it? And I'm actually thinking, yeah, that doesn't actually make any sense. Are they actually being used differently? Are they actually being used by, say, people selling things during performance? You know, I mean, I, in, the, in the old days when you used to have an usherette in the cinema coming around with a tray of things at the interval, you know, they've got the hands, you know, the hands are busy, you know, where do you put the coins? You put them in the pot. There's a pot tied to your belt, maybe. Are they being used in that way? Yeah. Do they have a different function? So, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I thank I thank, I thank Bill for that one going, really? Are you sure? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. think about that. That's the reason for intermissions and uh, plays that don't need to have intermissions. Yeah, you've got people, we, you know, contemporary accounts that people are selling things during performance. So yeah, yeah what are they doing with the money? Is that what they're used for? Yeah, yeah, that's another whole you know, dynamic. They're, 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 yeah, they're, they're, used, they're used for something because we find, as I say, we find lots of them. Yeah, uh, where, wherever you have people gathered, you're going to have... Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's, financial, there's financial transactions of you know small small change financial transactions going on so yeah yeah that's so interesting it really is it, it, it uh, fills in the picture uh, so much uh, well I wanted to thank you again and again and again this oh. is your Sunday morning and I, I wanted to catch you at a time because you you are a busy, the people I in, uh, I'm talking to in this series are busy people. And I really, really appreciate uh, your your time. And if something comes up and then you're now a, uh, you're now- I've got, a, I've got my coffee, I'm good. You got your coffee. <laughs> I've got my coffee, I'm good. You yeah. got your coffee. Uh, you are a friend of the program now. And so- <laughs> You, uh, if you want to come on, if I ever develop any kind of uh, audience, I'm really focused on Japan and right now, but, uh, and, and we have a small, but very, very engaged audience of, uh, very, of people who are very interested in this, uh, work that you're doing. And, uh, so if you, if I continue on with this type of thing and you want me to help uh, I don't, even if I'm doing this or just on an email list or something, uh, I will uh, help in any way I can. And, uh, and thank you so very much for joining well, us. 
thank you thank you for inviting me it's it's a really splendid way to spend a sunday morning it's yeah <laughs> what's not what's not to love about a playhouse yeah okay well bye 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 <laughs> bye tom <laughs>